So this is module four. And in this module, we'll be focusing on classification methodologies. So the objective of this module is to introduce what classification is and when you would want to apply it. And then from there, we'll try and understand what types of data tend to work well for classification, maybe what kinds don't. Uh, we'll go over a few common classification methods, and then we'll assess the classification model performance. So obviously, we can't go over an exhaustive list of all classification methods. So we'll just kind of be going over a few. And then hopefully from there, you'll have the uh, information that you need to be able to extend it to other methods and um, kind of be able to teach yourself or maybe work with other people or even send us an email and we can help you work through it too. So taking us back to the overall decision tree, uh, pretty big, pretty messy, but where we're focusing on is this area right here. So the classification branch. So there are different types of classification in terms of uh, is the outcome multi-class, is it binary? And then there are different methods that you can use from there. And then typically the way that you would address uh, assessing the model is by splitting the training set into train and validation to identify an optimal model and then using the best test set or using the best model from the validation set to apply onto the testing set. So I guess we'll start with what exactly is classification? So it's an area of supervised learning where the goal is to predict class labels. So is this tumor benign? Is it malignant? Is this person uh, going to default on their mortgage or not? Things like that. You can also have multi-class outcomes where the model gets more complex, but we'll be mainly focusing on binary outcomes. Um, so in terms of the multi-class classification, it's just a bit more complex and a bit more involved. Um, but it's not too hard once you understand the binary classification model to then extend it to the multi-class. So the typical type of data structure you want for classification is, well, the data needs to contain some kind of distinct groups. So if you don't have explanatory variables that are good at identifying which group the response belongs to, you're going to have a really tough time. So you have to understand how well does your explanatory variables explain the differences between the groups in your response variable. That's really going to drive how well does the model work for the data. Beyond that, in terms of your response variable, you want your classes to be uh, balanced. And what that means is you want around an equal number of observations for each class. So if you have a data set with 100 people, 99% uh, of them don't have a disease and only one person does have a disease and you're trying to classify you know, who does and who doesn't have a disease, it's gonna be really tough because you don't have enough um, observations for the positive class. And so anytime you have a class imbalance, depending on the severity of it, it can really bias your model. So anything that's relatively balanced, you know, 60, 40, even 70, 30 isn't too bad. Um, you know, you just want to be cognizant of how is the data distributed among the different classes. And then finally, uh, the last part of the data structure is the complexity of the data primarily is what is going to drive your model selection here. So the issue with linear models is that they kind of need the data to be linearly separable. And what that means is effectively what linear models do, they can really only draw a line in the sand, we'll call it. You know, the line is very linear and it's very rigid. So if you're on one side of the line, you know, you might be labeled as a zero. Other side of the line, you're a one. There's not a lot of nuance to it. And so if your data isn't linearly separable, then the linear models probably aren't going to do that great of a job. So if you run into this scenario where your data might not be linearly separable, um, you can use a nonlinear modeling technique and what this does is it gives you a bit more flexibility in terms of you know, how nuanced can the relationships be? Because rarely in real world, large data set bioinformatics data analysis, it's not always going to be a linear relationship. So one thing you can do is just try both ways on your training set and assess them on your validation set. And then from there, you can see how well did it work? Does the linear model seem to be you know, good enough or should we, would we be better off with a more complex model? 
So what are some of the more common methods? So we've been over logistic regression this morning a little bit. So it's the extension of the linear model. Um, it's pretty simple. It's fairly straightforward. And from there, we can go up a step in terms of complexity and go to penalized regression, which is, again, can be thought of as another extension on the linear model. And effectively what it is, is it penalizes how complex your model is. And what happens from there is some variables will be forced to be dropped from the model or the regression coefficients will be forced to be very small. And so it's kind of useful when you have large data sets to kick out all of the non-useful variables. And then finally, a step up from there would be nonlinear modeling and machine learning techniques. So these are typically more difficult to fit, but in complex data sets, they can work a lot better. But then the flip side of that is in simpler data sets, they might actually work a lot worse because they're just far too complex models for the nature of the simple data. So going over a bit of what the logistic regression classification kind of looks like, this is getting back to what I was saying about the traditional linear model, kind of just drawing a line in the sand. So the blue line is just a traditional linear model. And so effectively, how it classifies is, are you above a certain threshold? Are you below a certain threshold? That's your classification. So the logistic regression does a bit of a better job. Uh, it's the red line here. And so this is a bit more of an S-shaped curve. And what this allows is for a, there to be a bit more nuance in identifying the uh, binary outcome in this instance. So how do you actually go about evaluating the logistic regression model? So a pretty common method is to use the receiver operating characteristic or ROC curve. And basically what this gives is kind of an idea of how you can balance the true positive rate against the false positive rate at various thresholds throughout the model. So from here, you need to identify, based off your classification model, are you more, po are you more okay with true positives? Uh, or sorry, are you more okay with false positives or false negatives? because that kind of identif identifies how you should be balancing the ROC curve, um, because it's very rarely that you can have both uh, low, both false positives and false negatives. It's typically you kind of have to do one or the other or do an okay job at both. So that's entirely dependent on the nature of the classification problem at hand. Uh, from there, what you can do is you can calculate the area under the ROC curve, or we just call this the AUC. And this is just a nice, quick, single value summarization of the overall performance of the classification model. So getting a bit more into penalized regression. Um, so there are typically three main models for penalized regression. Uh, the first is ridge regression. Second is the lasso, which is the least absolute shrinkage and selection operator. And the third is the elastic net. Uh, these are pretty common in biological scenarios. Uh, and biological and bioinformatics research papers that I've seen, uh, typically because they can work with very high dimensional data sets. And the reason they can do that, as I mentioned earlier, is that they restrict the sum of the coefficients in the model to be below some value. So effectively what they're doing is they're penalizing any coefficients which have a large coefficient, uh, any variables which have a large coefficient. And so what happens from this is the model tends to drop any variables which aren't that informative. And so you can infer based off the variables that are left in the model that these are likely to be the most influential variables in determining your outcome. So getting into a little bit of math, I won't go into it very much, but at the bottom what we have is your traditional linear model, right? So you have y, your response, is equal to beta naught, which is your intercept, plus your coefficients, so beta 1, beta 2, all the way through beta n, depending on how many variables you have, multiplied by the variable itself. And so, you know, kind of going back to high school math, y equals mx plus b, this is kind of just an extension of that, right? So the lasso equation is at the top. And so what we're trying to do here is minimize this kind of mess of an equation. But really what I wanted to point out is, is that the interior part that's kind of highlighted, the y minus beta naught minus the sum of the x betas, is the traditional linear model. And all we've really done is added, so the next part is the plus lambda sum of the betas. 
And so this lambda kind of determines how strict the penalty is and how much shrinkage is going to happen. And so this just effectively minimizes how large your beta coefficients can be. So with that, uh, what are they really good for? So ridge regression is a little bit different because it doesn't actually remove variables from the model. It just shrinks the coefficients to near zero, but the lasso and the elastic net can actually set them to zero, which removes them from the model. So we'll be kind of focusing more on that. So they're really good when you have more variables than you have observations in your data set, p greater than n. In this scenario, the traditional linear model actually can't be fit. So um, using the lasso and the elastic net are kind of your only options for uh, in terms of traditional linear models, unless you want to do some other kind of uh, di dimension reduction techniques. They're also really good for identifying the most influential variables in the data set, as I've gone over before. And they're really good when you may be concerned about overfitting in your model. So in the scenario where you think the data may be a little too simplistic and that the model may be picking up on error variants rather than the true signal, these models can help reduce the chance of overfitting. So finally, moving on to the third method is random forest. So random forest is a very common machine learning algorithm. It's typically the first one that people are introduced to. Um, it's fairly simple. You know, it takes a little bit of time to kind of wrap your head around, but in terms of the machine learning space, it is one of the more simplistic algorithms. And effectively what it is, is just a decision tree, kind of like the flowchart that we're presenting. So uh, what it does is based off the variables in the model, it makes splits in the decision tree. Are you, is this sample from environment one or is it from environment two? And based off that, the estimate goes down that branch of the decision tree until you reach a terminal node. And so effectively, every time you reach a terminal node, you're given an estimate. So if you belong in environment one, you belong to species five, and you have um, some observed value greater than 10, then the estimate is X. So that's kind of how it goes. You just bin each classification, put them down the decision tree, and at the end, you come out with a estimate. So the issue with random forest and pretty much every machine learning algorithm is that there's uh, parameters which need to be optimized. And so this kind of complicates things because if you don't optimize the parameters of the model, you're probably not going to have that great of a fit. Some models are better than others for not optimizing the hyperparameters, but it is something that you need to be cognizant of. If you want a good fitting model, you're going to have to go through the model optimization process. So when would you use random forest? So again, as with the penalized regression, it's really good when you have more observations than variables, or sorry, more variables than observations, because the linear models don't work in that scenario. So you kind of have to look towards other alternative methods, and these would be this would be one of them. It also can identify the most influential variables. I'm hoping we can kind of get into that in the example. And it's also really good when the relationship may be nonlinear. So unlike uh, linear models, and penalized regression, which are extensions of the linear model, if the mo if the relationship being modeled is nonlinear, they're going to have to estimate it with a linear relationship, which depending on the nonlinearity of the relationship may cause a lot of information loss. So random forest and other machine learning techniques are really great because you don't have to be as concerned about the information loss when you're modeling nonlinearity. So with that, that's the end of the presentation. And we'll get into the module four classification lab.